when those things happen and you are hyper aroused, yeah, you're, yeah. you're overstimulated, you're agitated, you cannot come down to a place of calm, you know, you, you know that you are not relying fully on God the way you should yeah. because you're having physiological reactions yes. to fears and stresses that are going on with you. Some tools, right? When we talk about casting down yes. every imagination, right. how do you do that? How do you do that when you have events that happen in your past that yeah. physiologically cause you to react in ways you're not sleeping anymore, yeah, you're worried, you're right. panicked? Your, te- your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And in mental health, mindfulness is talked about a lot, right? And that's just being present. Mm-hmm. There's physiological tools that you can use yeah. to cause your own body to check in with the temple first yeah. and move yourself out of the way so that God can marinate yeah. over your wound. Yes. And the scripture is the medicine. Yeah. That is, that is the antibiotic. Last time we talked about yeah. a- attachment theory, we talked about experiences mm-hmm. of attachment in, in childhood. And so I guess this is like a part two of <laughs> apostolic perspectives and mm-hmm. psychology with a focus on trauma. Yes. Um, and so before we get started, I, I'd like to just throw this your way and, uh, and so that we can get a, uh, a good working definition of what trauma means. How is it used in the psycho- psychological field? Mm-hmm. And perhaps how is it used in uh, popular culture, right? Yeah, because I think question. there's differences mm-hmm. between the more technical uh, psychological definition and how it popularly mm-hmm. is used amongst everyone. I and, agree. And things. So I'll just throw it your way and do okay. what you want with the prompt. Okay, okay sounds good. So I wanted to go over the definition of trauma, the word, and then I wanted to go over the Diagnostical Statistical Manual, which is what therapists use as diagnosticians to diagnose. It's kind of our quote-unquote Bible that we go by to to diagnose and treat and also um, psychiatrists and doctors. And so I wanted to go over both and then the pop culture term and what it means in real time to real people. Okay. So the definition of trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience. So part of that is, though, the caveat to that. It's not just that it's deeply distressing and disturbing, but it's also that you're in some way feeling the distress when the mm. bad thing is not happening anymore. Mm. Okay. Okay, so the, the danger is clearly over, the bad thing is clearly over, but you're still feeling a response in your heart and in your emotions and in your body that is distressing and also the avoidance of trying to think about it so anything that you try to put out of your mind is probably a sign that it was slightly traumatizing or severely traumatizing to you sometimes the brain (laughs) will put things out of our mind or not we don't even want it to okay so that can happen too so post-traumatic stress disorder To be diagnosed by a doctor or a therapist with post-traumatic stress disorder, there has to be an identifiable exposure to actual threat to your life or bodily harm, either to yourself or seeing it done to somebody else in front of you. So direct experience of a traumatic event or witnessed experience of traumatic event also can be learning of someone you love so you have an attachment to that person, a child or a spouse or a friend Mm -hmm. that experienced a death or physically traumatic event. Okay. Okay. So these um, experiences are firsthand repeat can be, they can be a single experience or they can be firsthand repeated extreme exposure to adverse details of a traumatic event. So it's not just seeing something on TV, like, right. I don't know why I think of nine 11 is very, very old, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not just seeing something on TV and going, Oh, <gasps> Oh, right. that's terrible, right. right? But it's something where there's you have an attachment to the actual person. Like yeah. almost it could have happened to you because you right. love that person okay. or you really care yeah. about that person. You, it, 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 it seems like it would have to be a person in which you have a deep empathetic connection mm-hmm. yes. to. You feel empathy as if they were part of who you mm-hmm. are. They're part of your group, your family, someone you care about deeply. Yes. Wow. Okay. And that can traumatize you. And so the disturbance regardless of the trigger, has to cause um, clinically significant distress. And so one of the prompts we had talked, you had sent me was, 
can something traumatizing happen yet someone's not traumatized? Mm-hmm. And that's absolutely that's true. And we can talk more about that later. Okay. But to be post traumatic stress disorder, it right. does have to transfer over to later after the bad thing has happened. Yeah. And the person is still experiencing that distress or impair and it's impairing their life in some way. Yeah. Even maybe just the relationships. Yeah. yeah. So social interactions, capacity to work or do other important functioning. <laughs> um it's not uh, the psychological response to uh, a brain tumor, uh, any type of medical condition, mm-hmm. drugs or alcohol. Yeah. And so it's r- directly related yeah. to that event. And yeah. it started happening after that yeah. event. So, so let me ask you this, just for more details. What kind of things would somebody feel if they were uh, um, experiencing PTSD? Uh, what kind of are the physiological experiences, emotional, maybe mental Good experiences uh, or flags that people can say, wait, I, you know, I think mm-hmm. I've experienced something like that. Or where people can say, I haven't quite experienced that. So I'm, sh- you know, uh, we can get a better gauge as to what it's what it's okay, like to experience good. it. So there has to be. So for this part, I'm going to bring up my phone because I have okay. not memorized every diagnostic criteria yeah. of it. Okay. There's quite a bit. So there has to be avoidance. Okay. And so one of the following, avoiding trauma-related thoughts and feelings. Okay. Or trauma-related external reminders. Okay. So you may think about it all the time, but you avoid a place. Or you may go to that place fine where it happened. Okay. But you try to focus on other things and not think. One of the two. Yeah. Okay. So there has to be... um, Negative alterations in cognitions and emotions, right? You're having a negative emotional effect like... And there only has to be two of these. Okay. Inability to recall key features of the trauma. There's parts that are being blocked out. You okay. should remember, but you don't. Right. Overly negative thoughts and assum- assumptions about yourself and the world. So now you're try- starting to generalize this fear mm-hmm. about you or other people because of it. Exaggerated blame of yourself or others causing the trauma. Something mm-hmm. that an outsider is not rational, that you're yeah. overly blaming yourself or somebody else. Nav- negative affect, which just means a negative mood, depressed, yeah. okay, sad, Dis- decreased interest in activities. So you're not the things you used to be interested in. You're not so interested yeah. in them anymore. Feeling isolated, even though you may not be isolated. Yeah. And difficulty experiencing positive feelings. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's not, you only have to have two of those. Yeah. So the other part is the arousal or reactivity. So in this area, there only has to be the trauma related arousal reactivity that began or worsened after the trauma are in these ways. So you're more irritable and aggressive. Okay. You're doing risky, more risky behavior. You're more ambivalent about the risk of things. Mm-hmm. Um, destructive behavior, hypervigilance. You're on edge. You're mm-hmm. looking around constantly, uh, worried, watching, heightened startle reaction or response, difficulty concentrating and difficulty sleeping. Mm. And these things have to last for more than a month. Okay. So if something happens to somebody you know, and you're like, oh, they're yeah. going to have PTSD. Yeah. And they're having these things a week later. Yeah. According to a therapist or a doctor, they may not be diagnosed yet. It has Got to it. be a month. Yeah. So are there other aspects of these uh, experiences that are completely normal? Uh, not to mean that they're not of concern, but mm-hmm. let's say, it, you know, if if a significant negative event happened to an individual and they struggle with something for a week to two weeks, is there something wrong with that person or is there something about even those negative uh, experiences that is a part of normal processing of uh, mm-hmm. traumatic or uh, negative events? Yes. So cut. Normal and what I found working when I worked on a comprehensive high school campus for eight years, I saw so many unfortunately um, parental p- parents pass away and kids find out. It was real, a lot of real time stuff. It was a lot. Of, it's kind of mental health first responder, first aid kind of stuff. I often found when a child lost a significant family member, uh, oftentimes they would be in total shock. Mm. It'd be like it didn't happen at all. They just yeah. couldn't believe it. So disbelief can yeah. is definitely a response. And sometimes people push and push and push. Oh, someone needs to talk to them. Someone needs to talk to them. Mm -hmm. And you need to offer to be talked, but sometimes they need time. Mm -hmm. So shock is an appropriate response. Any of these are appropriate responses. One of the diagnostic things that I ask people when they have a traumatic event happen, when I'm assessing for PTSD is, when the bad thing happened, did you run around and scream? Younger 
people are, I found that to be true. Okay. Someone will, you know, run around in circles screaming. That's a, a sign that what's yeah. happening is can be traumatizing to okay. them. But one thing, although it's hard to see a family member go through anything, especially as an adult when mm -hmm. we have so much information and we see it, one of our children go through something so horrible, if somebody's experiencing those things up to a month, having somebody that's responsive to them that they trust that they can talk mm. about it with really is the most effective treatment Yeah, for them to talk about something as soon as they can. Yeah. And you can't make anybody talk to you. So right. that's not going to be effective. Yeah. Cause when they're ready to talk, they may not go to you because yeah. you pressured them and made them uncomfortable. Right. But being available to talk about yeah. what happened is mm. really, really important yeah. to their brain and where, what their brain does with that. And if they're having negative reactions like nightmares, yeah. night terrors, things like that, and it's been under a month, the, the bright side of that is their brain is trying to work it out and your their brain okay. is facing it. Okay. Right? Yeah. It's not, oh, I don't know what happened. That would that would probably worry me more. Right. If okay. somebody was acting like it didn't happen, maybe yeah. act, not remembering it happened, that right. it's going to come out eventually. Mm -hmm. So I would rather have someone having some strong responses at first. Mm -hmm. Because they're probably going to do better later. Yeah, probably. Have have you have you ever thought about why why that is why facing it, maybe being able to articulate mm -hmm. it, produces healthier coping with that event than hiding it, burying it, putting it mm -hmm. under the rug, right. as we would say, as yeah. would commonly is said. Have you ever thought about why that that that's the case? All the time. Okay. <laughs> because, Give us some of your thoughts. Yeah, you know, sure. so, perhaps some of some of your thoughts on on why that is. Yes, yeah, yeah. because do, well, doing this 18 years. Okay. The first eight years of my career, I worked in a clinic with homicidal, suicidal, psychotic children and victims of trauma. Okay. So these kids had, we were a higher level of care, meaning they could come in as many times a week as they want. It wasn't mm -hmm, a typical mm -hmm. outpatient setting. Okay. It was intensive outpatient. Yeah. So right away, I started to see that kids that got treatment right away, mm -hmm. usually with by the time they're in cl our clinic, part of the common criteria was they didn't talk about it to anybody. And now it's coming out through behaviors. Okay. So yes, I've thought a lot about this. Yeah. And then even now when I get new clients, I'm always looking at history because it tells me about their brain. Yeah. So what I found, and I've studied as well, and really was through, and Dan Siegel's work is really where I've, I came across this first, mm -hmm. was the left brain, our logic, facts and figures, mm -hmm. our right brain, our emotional side, and children's right brains being more developed. It takes a really long time for our left brain to develop versus mm -hmm. our right brain. Mm -hmm. But we start talking when we're like two and three. So yeah. as parents, sometimes we're like, you know, you, you memorize all this scripture. Yeah. Why are you having a meltdown? You're so smart, yeah, right, right, <laughs> you know, or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but th the left brain takes so much more time to develop the logic, facts, figures, yeah. law, rationale, yeah. reason. And so with working with kids and what I found as well was the more that children can, can an, an adult can connect to the right brain experience, mm -hmm. which is your feelings, your emotions, mm -hmm. um, your sensate, your sense. Yeah. So your, your felt sense, the more that that can be connected with once that's connected with it, it's, uh, and it, I see it outside. I'm not saying this is a brain spec, yeah. but I got the idea from him. The left brain can engage because maybe it feels safe to engage. Yeah. When we feel safe, when we feel heard, okay. listened to and emotionally joined. Yeah. We can actually think very well. Yeah. And so even in the context of trauma, yeah. kids can start after time putting things into context themselves. Yeah. So it's interesting. And there's a st statement that you said right now, uh, because a big thing, at least within our Pentecostal movement, is, is something called Bible quizzing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and you mentioned the scenario where, you know, so much scripture, you know, so much of the word of God, you memorized it. Why aren't you living better like why why are you struggling with these things if you know all of these scriptures mm -hmm. um and so combining that with some of what you have said as well uh, uh at least some of the theoretical psychological side um there is a difference between knowing the story of david and goliath mm -hmm. and how david defeated goliath and there's a difference between knowing that story uh, with a, a, uh, as information and actually connecting that story to my personal life Related and to saying it. Goliath is my current problem. Uh, that is a 
right left brain connection that is deeper than just saying, well, it's good that David defeated Goliath. What about me, right? Right. And so the, I think this that's the journey that children into adolescence go through in understanding that those stories that you heard as a child and just memorized uh, as information can have deeper meaning to your soul. And right. it can be a, uh, um, symbolically, metaphorically uh, applied to the current struggles that you're going right. through. And I think that's where youth say, man, that's revelation. I heard it my whole life, but I didn't really understand it yes. until one day, right? Mm -hmm. They heard that word and it came alive yes. in their lives and they connected, you know, psychologically we'd say left brain, right brain, meaning was made in their more whole self yes. Yes. rather than it just being some information in some book. And that is why... Uh, you you kind of said what I was going to say. Okay. That is why it's so important for our kids to know scripture. Right. It's so important to plant it in their heart. You're yeah. planting a seed. You're not yeah. going to see the fruit. But when someone feels safe, all of a sudden the seed start. You can't watch a flower grow. Right. It's not possible. Mm. But it doesn't mean you don't tend to the garden. And it doesn't that's mean you don't cultivate principle. it and yes. work at it. Wow. And so when that child feels safe, that's the anointing, or I, I don't want to say the magic, but for lack of a better word, yeah. the things that God miraculous. does. The miraculous, thank yeah. you. That God does in his own time away from a parent. Mm -hmm. We've planted those seeds of scripture. God makes it come alive, right? Yeah, He's right. the growth. Yes. We're just the planner. Yes. So I think that it's easy for parents to say, well, I'll do that when they're older. Or like I have a daughter who has a learning disability. And it would be easy for me to say, well, she doesn't get it anyways. Yeah. So why take the time? Yeah. But if I plan it consistently and I make it a wholesome situation. Yeah. So I think Bible quizzing is totally amazing. Yeah. And I think homeschooling is totally amazing yeah. Yeah. when it's done in a nurturing mm, way. Okay. Because then children have good association with scripture and good association right, with right, learning. Right, right. And then when the time is right, it could be in the room in the middle of the night. It mm -hmm. could be anywhere. That they are, God does what God does, and you've planted yeah. all that seed, and it just starts growing because yeah. they feel safe in the presence of God. Wow, yeah. So, yes. you know, and, and there's scripture to back that, right? Because Jesus tells his disciples, you know, that to not worry about what they were, that they're going to say when they're put into yeah. certain circumstances in life, but the Spirit will bring to remembrance all the things that I have taught you. Uh, they didn't in they in many ways they didn't even realize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah yes. and that the kingdom of God had come first to their souls right. uh, until later on yes. right and the word of God actually says and they remembered that Jesus said I right? love that you're bringing this up yeah. because this also has to do with with it makes me think of my the work I do in trauma work okay the type of work that I do in trauma work we actually process a traumatic event in session. Mm. And a lot of times people start to feel very safe. We don't do it the first time we meet, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a relationship and a rapport. And some of my clients are apostolic and Christian and some aren't. They don't even know. And they don't really know that I am either, yeah. right? We're just, we're working on their traumatic event. Okay. And they'll say at some point, I know this doesn't make sense to you probably, but I'm thinking I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. A scripture yeah. they learned when they were very, very right. young right. comes up when they feel safe. Yes. These are people that are probably not spirit filled. They don't have full knowledge of truth. Yeah. But at some point they took their kid to some Sunday school. They went on a bus to Sunday school. And at 37 years old, when they're yeah. working on their traumatic event, yeah. that scripture comes out. It's very, wow. okay. very profound. Yeah. So this is probably, this is the reason why sinners felt so comfortable with Jesus. It's a Christ principle here mm. because he said, the Lord hath anointed me to, heal the brokenhearted mm -hmm. to set free the captive he is literally painting a a uh, safe environment for sinners to imagine their lives people who who are living in disordinate or or chaotic states of of life mm -hmm. because they followed lies because they followed ways that are not the truth of the word of god they're just living they don't know how to live and yet god gives them a space to say, now imagine your life with God, and I'm giving you a safe environment for you to contemplate and say, what if I did have Christ? Hope. What if I did have God? 
hope. Mm -hmm. Hope is that's a, that's a powerful word right there. When hope is introduced and you begin to be able to imagine your future, not as a repetition of past negative events, but something has intervened and now given in me ability to envision a brighter future. Right. Uh, something very powerful happens there. Yes. And I believe yeah. also just reminds me of conviction versus guilt and shame. Okay. You know, conviction. And I've always explained to people, conviction always brings hope and empowerment. Yeah. You feel like you can do it even if on paper you can't when yeah. you're convicted about something. Yeah. And when you feel ashamed, yeah. it's disempowering. It leads you to condemnation. Weak. Yeah, I'm condemned. There is no hope for bad. Me. Yeah, wow, wow. Now, describe, describe, uh, describe why that's significant to mental health. Why is that significant to spiritual health? Um, the dynamic between hope and shame, conviction. I, I can imagine within a secular setting, conviction would look something like, "I know I need to do better to make better decisions." Um, and that conviction is, has with it hope. And I know I can, I know I see the way forward and the decisions that I can make, uh, that will lead me the right direction. Cause I have hope while condemnation and shame says, I'm never going to get out of this. Yeah, it's not possible. Oh, what is, what is that contrast? The PTSD that? stuff. Do you want me to finish Yeah, that? go, I'm go in there. Yeah, that. we're all, yeah, yeah, go ahead. But I do want to talk about yes, that. I know yes. I'm going to go way off. I know here, so. it'll probably <laughs> lead back to it eventually. Yes, yeah, to I'm be sorry. honest. Yeah, no, go ahead. I didn't go ahead. Forget. Finish it. Yes. So also with post-traumatic stress disorder, there has to be uh, an intrusion experience so that what that means is you're having the unwanted memory come back to you when you don't want it to okay. also known as a flashback okay and i want to talk about flashbacks more later as well oh, okay. and how, how they work in the brain great nightmares and the emotional distress after exposure to the reminders yeah so i have a client right now who has significant chronic post-traumatic stress disorder and if we say the word seven up that is a trigger right or sees if she sees a can of seven up that's a trigger for her yeah. to have yeah flashbacks yeah that would be an example some yeah. external st to stimuli a word anything like that that causes the distress to automatically happen and a physical reactivity after exposure to a trauma and okay. so sometimes when you see people react at a, a disproportionate to circumstances yeah other people around them it doesn't seem that's necessary yeah probably having a trauma response mm. <clears throat> to feeling trapped unheard not yeah. listened to something like that got it so that would kind of oh um I think we kind of mentioned this before, the avoidance of the stimuli, which okay. is kind of what I talked about, the 7-Up, yeah. avoiding things yeah. and topics okay. and people. Yeah, so you said flashbacks. Yes. Know, uh, flashbacks. Um, uh, why do flashbacks happen? Why can't we just hide? Why can't we just say, well, I'm just going to push it out of my mind and I won't have a flashback if I get good enough at burying this in, in some kind of subconscious cause it right, right right so flashbacks they're the younger we are and when things happen and we start to push them out of our mind let me back up well the younger you are right your brain's more malleable more pliable when when you're younger mm -hmm. and it seems to be that people sometimes have more sometimes have more strength and mentally to push aside than they do when they're older. Okay. Okay. I would think that that was opposite. Like if you're older, you have more mental strength than. I'm know. talking older. I'm talking like how old I'm. I am in your okay. 40s and 50s. Okay. Middle age. Middle kind of. age. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So when when we're children and distressing or bad things happen that we would rather not think about. Okay. So those can be minor, what we call small t traumas, life changes that nobody processes with us, divorce moving, a loss, a sibling dies, okay. a parent dies, things that, you know, we may not have seen something happen right in front of us, but it definitely drastically affects our life and yeah. divorce, things like that. And if, if nobody talks to us about it and yeah. says, I know this is hard for you, but can you tell me your experience? How yeah. do you feel about your brother's death or whatever it is? Nobody's talking to us about it. We try not to think about these things. Mm -hmm. We have defenses that will come up and help us defend away from those feelings, these, mm. these experiences. So these things are what we call like fight, flight, yeah. freeze. Okay. And there's a two other ones, attachment, cry, and submit. And so fight is like 
uh, rage, anger, controlling behavior, judgmental behavior, okay. rigid behavior, mm. suicidal behavior is a fight response. Okay. And so we don't, our brain doesn't want that bad experience and our present to come together and really process. Yeah. Because it doesn't understand. It thinks it needs to stay scared. Yeah. Because if I stay scared, I will always be protected. And that uh, bad thing, I will not let that bad thing happen again. Okay. Wow. Right? So flight can be like your panic attacks, yeah. your phobia, feelings of terror, um, eating disorders. That's mm -hmm. a way to kind of get away from the situation and not have to face it and focus on something else. Um, freeze response. So that's flight. So freeze responses also can go oh, panic attacks and it can panic attacks can morph into different things. Mm -hmm. They look different at, with different people. So that can be a flight or a fight depending on yeah. or a freeze, a flight or a freeze, depending on how what that looks like. Uh, but freezing is paralyzed, no voice, not able to think, mm, okay. not able to respond. Yeah. Um, so we have fight, flight, freeze. Submit is when, usually when, you've kind of lost that energy for those more, that think of those first three as, as a, the, we're going to do something about this. Okay. Okay. We're going to yeah. block this out by doing something. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm, an action. And submit is, I'm exhausted. Yeah. So usually not people pleasing when you know you don't want to do that, but you're yeah. doing it anyways. Okay. Um, submitting to things that are not healthy to you that okay. you know on paper or you know somewhere in your brain, you, you should not be saying yes to this person doesn't have your best interest at heart. Mm. Um, uh, submit can be, you know, subservient, again, to help unhealthy environments and feeling really physically exhausted. Fatigue is also... Mm. A symptom of trauma can mm -hmm. be a symptom. I have mm. clients that come with chronic fatigue. That's always a sign to me. There's probably yeah. some s trauma and they're going into submit mode to yeah. their body's just totally exhausted. Yeah. A distressed mm -hmm. state of being. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's cry, attach cry, which is crying out for people's attention that don't have your best interest at heart and okay. are not giving it to you, but you're continuing to wait yeah. by the phone. Um, you're continuing to, you can't handle when someone doesn't respond to you. Yeah. Um, you're constantly asking for help with things that you probably should be able to do on your own yeah. already or should know chasing after someone who obviously doesn't want mm -hmm. to be in a typical relationship with you. Yeah. And so these, these things will come up really usually to help to try to help push away, right? Okay. The facing the abandonment that yeah. happened when a parent left or died, other things like that. So what happens over time, usually when we're kids, we're trying to learn and grow and so we will push away, we start pushing away those dis instinctive defenses that come up as we hyper-focus mm. on other things. It's called okay. structural dissociation. Okay. So I'm an amazing student. Yeah. I'm an excellent piano player. Got it. Okay. I'm they, a really good pastor's kid. Okay. You know, I'm a really they good- They define their lives yes, over that external, frame. Yeah. Mm -hmm, an external yeah. thing. Okay. So they don't have to listen to that stuff anymore. Got it. Yeah. So I don't judge anybody's journey. You know, sometimes- People, though, when they're doing that, they feel I'm free. Yeah. I'm not worried about this stuff anymore. Right. It used to get me down. It doesn't now. Yeah. But they might still avoid talking about it. Right. With people. It doesn't mean you want to get in a microphone yeah. on YouTube and talk about oh, it. But of course. You yeah. should have some safe person in your life yeah. that you can process those things with. Yeah. So if you're still avoiding, yeah. you know if you have nightmares. You know if you're having it come up when you don't want it to. Yeah. What usually happens with structural dissociation is over time, yeah. people become almost hyperphobic of normal things. Yeah. Wow. And this is mid mid age yeah. and on where <laughs> getting out of bed is overwhelming now. Right. Cleaning my toilet is overwhelming wow. now. Yeah. I don't face it's like you get sensitized mm. to facing things that are annoying right. or even things you used to like to do. Yeah. And so you really become it's hard to some yeah. for some people, I mean, brushing teeth, getting out of bed some days. Yeah. They go into this place. Then we have life changes mm. at those ages where women yeah. go into premenopause or perimenopause, menopause, um, you know, different different things that happen later in life. Which yeah. Adult children, you right. know, maybe they leave God or just things that mm. you never thought would happen. Yeah. And there, there becomes this identity crisis and, and turning away isn't so easy anymore. Mm, okay. Um, it almost sounds like this is a, I'm a very pictorial guy. Uh, I almost imagine like a, a pressure of an ooze that you've been able to control, but mm -hmm. it's now gushing out of your fingers mm -hmm. and it's 
going into areas that you never thought it would. It's affecting ways Mm -hmm. and it's just coming out in different places of your life that you never even thought it could or would uh, tying your shoes, you yes, know, right. ironing your clothes. It's like, oh, I just can't iron my clothes right yes, now. Yes, it's overwhelming. And it's, ooh, it's, it's so, you know, this is, you're saying that this could be a product of these unresolved things that have been ignored or pushed mm-hmm. aside for so long, yes. but now are somehow showing themselves. Right, and yeah. some therapists have called it PTSD collapse. Okay. You're collapsing under all yeah. of it. Wow. Okay. And you don't have the energy to maybe get back up. But this goes back to how the brain works. Yeah. It's ingenious yeah. in those younger years for our brain to push back these things by yeah. looking at something yeah. else. It's, yeah. It helps us cope. Yeah. It gets a social, you know, div- being in social circles, a lot of times I'll see, you know, kids are obsessed with friends. Yeah. People think it's really normal for kids to want to be with their friends. And there is normalcy to that. I'm not saying that's totally weird or anything like that. However, Sometimes kids use it as a way to not deal with things. Yeah. You know, right. do they overly hyperly focus on social interaction so that they don't have to face or deal with other things? So, yeah. and we can all do that into our 20s and 30s or whatever. But um, back to, you know, how the brain works. Um, the difference between somebody having a traumatic event affect them in a negative way and somebody having a traumatic event, am I going too far ahead? No, no, okay. no, not at all. And somebody having a traumatic event that they seem to adapt, they seem to come to resolution with and be able to u- actually even use that to make them more resilient and mm-hmm. stronger and um, become more empowered and wise and all of those things Yeah, is usually connected to, kind of back to our last pod- a podcast, attachment. Okay. And so when we're younger and we're babies, kind of, I'm going to review it really quick. I won't yeah. go real, real, real deep into it. But we, when we talked about last time is our, when we're, when, when babies are born, their right brain is more developed. They let us know they need things by crying, screaming, <laughs> all those things yeah. that babies do yeah. emotionally to communicate to us. When we're, our needs are met, we are able to access what's called our ventral vagal nerve, which is our calm. Mm -hmm. We're at total peace and calm. Mm -hmm. When we're able, when a caregiver is able to attune to our needs and able to meet those needs and we're able to find that ventral vagal nerve activation over and over again, it's easier to find it Mm -hmm. later. Yeah. And when babies are overwhelmed because their needs are not met or maybe they're screamed at or whatever happens when, you know, if I'm talking about over and over again, right, I'm not talking right. about losing your mind, losing your, losing your patience right. once or twice or time, yes, yeah, sometimes yeah. it happens. I'm talking about chronic being left mm-hmm. and all of those things. Babies will go into, and we do too, hyper arousal, right? Agitation, rage, overstimulation. They will go back down to hypo arousal, mm-hmm. which is shut down. Yeah. And babies, that's how they learn to cope. Yeah. So this happens. Wow. Your brain from 32 weeks on yeah. starts to learn how to go in hyper and hypo arousal. Yeah. Wow. 32 weeks of pregnancy on. Yeah. And so babies start learning. But the identity that they find and start identifying themselves with shameful things doesn't start. They think until three. This is not science. This is years and years of research. Yeah. But they don't really know. But they seem to be able to have a self-identification. Mm-hmm. With I am basically worthy of being neglected. I am shameful. That kind mm-hmm. of thing. About three years old, that starts happening. That yeah. internal dialogue will start to form at three. Yeah. So, the when you're younger, baby, to all your developing years, the more that your parents are, your caregivers doesn't have to be your biological parents, but the more caregivers are attuned to your emotions, mm-hmm. the more that they delight in who you are, and they you bring them a sense of joy, and you know you do. Mm-hmm. the more you're held mm-hmm. close when you need it, um, the more you're listened to when you're unsafe, you have a mm-hmm. safe place. The more that happens more consistently, just like when traumatic events happen, mm. what happens in the brain is, I'm kind of going all over. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, no, that's I'm so fine. sorry. But in traumatic events, when we're trapped, when we are not safe, when we are all alone chronically, 
we have an experience that every time that happens later, yeah. it's a thread. Okay. So w- later on, when you have one of those themes, like I'm alone, I'm trapped, I'm unsafe, right, there's right. several of them. Okay. That happens. You're not just having one memory. Right. You're having several memories. Yes. Okay. That you Light have up at the perceived same time. as a as a pattern of experience. It's extremely it's intense. Collapsed together. Yeah. Yes, it's extremely it. intense, Got and it. it can send you into hyper arousal. Yeah. You're overstimulated, you're agitated, yeah. all of that. Yeah. But just like that, in the positive, right. that can be planted, yeah. and you're re-experiencing emotional joining and connection, yeah. feeling safe, getting your needs met and protected when you need to get your needs met and protected. It builds that up. So later... You can experience trauma, but you have a buffer. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I have seen people that I know that I work with back when I worked at the high school, especially a lot of things happen. And I would have people that had obviously very secure attachments, witness life-threatening things happen in front of them. Mm -hmm. Even someone dying that they knew Mm -hmm. happened in front of them. And they knew to talk about it because Mm -hmm. they were able to talk when they were kids. Yeah. So now they're 37, 47. They're talking about it. They're talking about it. And they do really, really well. And they'll have no adverse, they'll talk, later on they can talk about what happened, say that was really sad. Sometimes I still think about that. And I think, wow, you know, I'm I'm really glad I was there to hold that person when they passed away. Or they find some type of adaptive piece of information to add to that. And they never go to therapy for it. Mm. It's because neurologically their resilience is much stronger. Yeah. So we talked about something like this on our way here to the podcast. And I kind of um, offered my hypothesis on it, you know, mm-hmm. um, based on what I've read, because there's some articles that I read, um, two of them in particular uh, by this scholar named Robin Fivush, Fivush, and she does a lot on narrative. She does a lot on how the family plays a central role in the health, in the psychological and emotional health of a child by helping them think about their past in, in productive ways, in beneficial ways. And there are two studies or two papers that she wrote uh, with other authors. She's the one that I, I remember. One of them is uh, they studied uh, children who had gone through traumatic events and said that mo- uh, children whose mothers were able to gave them, give them causal language, mm-hmm. language that was causal, for mm-hmm. example, This happened because of that. This happened because of this reason in this time at this location. Uh, Later on in their life are able to cope with stressful events better. Um, And also another paper that they wrote uh, regarding uh, how when mother, a mother child uh, connection happens, and mothers help their children reminisce or think about the past, the child can appropriately identify their self in the past. Right. Right. And basically what that means is they can define their experience as having occurred, to speak of it in spatial terms, over there. And because I'm not over there in the past, that is not here. And I can, in a healthy way, distance myself not in the way that you're dissociating right. not in the way that you're ignoring but in the way that i can define what happened i place it within a definition mm-hmm. and because i am not within these defined circumstances i know that i am not in the same circumstance and it can't affect me yes. like it did back yes. then um and and so we didn't really get time to really dig into that but what are your thoughts on that hypothesis and if you can maybe add some more nuance to maybe clarify it or correct it or your experiences in in dealing with that dynamic. Sure. I think that that is wonderful. When I have a parent in my office, a child already has a connection with a caregiver they feel Mm -hmm. safe with. That Mm -hmm. works great. That's amazing because I have concerned parents that something bad happened to their kid and they're bringing the kid in and they're going, is is she going to be okay? Is she going to be okay? Is she going to be okay? And what you told me that totally works. They Mm. need to have a safe place to talk about Mm -hmm. what happened in an adult. So it's really important to be a safe place with your kids when bad things aren't happening. Yeah. So when something happens in your child's life, they feel they can run to you. Yeah. Right. Because you're going to be there and you're going to talk about it with them and focusing on talking about their experience. Yeah. 
being aware of your own fear because mm-hmm. sometimes even myself when I get nervous or scared yeah, I learn right. I tend to blab and so us not telling our children how to feel but just letting them have a place to express yeah. their feelings right. about what's going on and yeah. ask appropriate questions yeah the the thing that when it comes to attachment some people never have that safe place in the younger years of yeah. any adult that's wanting to know how they feel about anything right. and so one thing that i i feel is my passion is helping people that didn't get that peace mm-hmm. they didn't get those positive thing those positive threads yeah no one helped and, them through that journey of yes, connecting it uh-huh yeah. and so that's why the holy ghost is so important and yes. it's also backing up to parenting it's so important to remember that a child who did not get those needs met at younger, if they were put in a foster placement mm-hmm. with somebody that was able to be patient with their feelings okay. and to be firm, but safe, yeah, right. Have boundaries, of course, be firm, but safe, which takes a lot of patience and being spirit led. It's like, you know, it's a calling, yeah, right. That God can rewire their brain. Yeah. I believe that. Yeah. And you see it. Ha- those relationships can do the same thing that therapy can do. Yes. Right. Okay. And so us being in the church, maybe not having those attachments, mm-hmm. maybe not having anybody who's ever taught. We've never ever practiced talking about mm. those things with anybody. Mm-hmm. Having the Holy Ghost is a great, great foundation for that healing to, for the Holy Ghost to continue to work on that healing. Yeah. Right. It's because we have, we open up our spirits and we let our guards down in the presence of God. When we feel his presence, we mm-hmm. feel completely safe. So he's our safe place. Yeah. Right. He's that t- sometimes that's the only time a, someone's ventral vagal nerve has probably been a- accessed. Yeah. If no one's ever felt calm, I have many clients who have complex post-traumatic stress disorder mm-hmm. and horrific childhoods. They, when I talk about the calm versus numb to mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. they they will tell me, I don't think I've ever been calm. Interesting. Wow. The Holy Ghost. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yes. <laughs> yes. He's everything yeah. you need. Right. And so the Holy Ghost is so important mm-hmm. because it's, you're accessing your ventral vagal nerve and you can retell your stories yeah. with a safe person wow. when you feel safe. Yeah. Wow. And that can help heal you. Yeah. Therapy is great. I, I love doing what I do. I'm so thankful that I have this ministry and all of that. But I don't believe that everybody has to have it. Yeah. I believe everybody needs the Holy Ghost. Yes. And sometimes God uses therapy mm-hmm. to help someone process their traumatic Guided. event with yes. a safe person yeah. that has no connection to their inner world, no authority over their life. Right. Okay. No connection to their inner no consequences. Yes. Yeah. There's There's no sometimes con- that nature of a relationship is necessary. Yes. For yeah. total safety. Yeah. Could, someone who doesn't have a stake in it. It's not a parent. Yes. It's not a friend. It's a not a spouse. A spouse. Yes. It's somebody completely outside of the situation. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting, I've never thought about that, mm-hmm. uh, of why uh, that counseling relationship sometimes is very effective and it yeah. is important and can make a positive effect in even a Christian's life. Yes. Huh. I right. never thought about it that way. Now I'm, I'm going to add some theology here, right? Because Please. I'm, I'm a, uh, I'm a minister. I'm a pastor, right? I like thinking about these things, but also it recalls scripture. You use the term that God is the Prince of peace. And I like pointing to this out every time someone says it, because that concept of Prince of Peace was used in Isaiah as the name of God and it being the, unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given, which means that that identity is actually attached to Jesus Christ himself. Mm-hmm. But that term Prince of Peace is actually not a unique term that is used. There are many kings in the ancient times is even during the time of Isaiah when it was written, that would call themselves the king of peace. Mm. There, there was a common label. Why did they use that label? They would use that label to convince the constituents within that nation that you are safe to make a life here because I am such a powerful king that I can defend the borders and you don't have to fear that if you start a life here, if you build your house here, if you start planting fields here, if you begin your world and have having children, you will not have to fear other kingdoms coming and taking everything from you. Why? Because I am a king of peace. 
And that concept is in the ancient times intimately connected with I defend the borders from that which can destroy you. Right. I defend the borders from that which can is is chaos. And so before God is a prince of peace, he is a mighty God. Yeah. And mighty God it means actually warrior God. Mm -hmm. He says, I am a mighty God, a warrior God. I am the prince of peace, which means that God protects the borders and I'm giving you a safe place to live. Yes. That safety is important. That right. safety, because without it, uh, people wouldn't feel like I can plant my stakes here. Yes. And in essence, people who we call having mental illness or perhaps having these uh, chaotic emotional states are individuals who have assumed I can't plant my foundation anywhere. That's right. I can't plant my flag anywhere. I can't call it anywhere my home. I can't call anyone someone who loves me and who I love mm. because everywhere is danger. That's right. And yet God comes into their lives and says, I'm creating a bro border for you, right. a hedge of protection, mm -hmm. and you can afford to build here. That's right. You can afford to have a family and a That's life right. here. I think that concept is so powerful. I believe it too. Yes. And it's all embedded in Prince of Peace. Yes. And one thing that I have found in my own personal life that has helped me because you can go on and feel you've dealt with things. Mm. Even as a therapist, you can okay. have therapy. You can do all of those things because you are a child of God, sojourning on this earth mm -hmm. and you've not arrived. You're not glorified yet. Yeah. I will never, ever, ever be fully healed. Yeah. I will always be needing to lean on God in some way and yeah. some level. I'll be fully functioning because yeah. by, he gives me the power. I can do all things through Christ yes. who gives me strength so I can function at optimal level even more than what I physically or mentally capable of because of him. But I will always have a, a spot inside of me that without God mm. will always ache if I don't have him. Hey, okay. Okay. And Very so good. in your life, yeah. whether you're accomplished in some way right. or it doesn't matter, if you start to struggle with things and you don't feel safe anymore, mm -hmm especially for women, we're having a women's conference this weekend, mm -hmm. especially for women, we can feel very vulnerable mm, okay. when certain parts of our identity are shaken because as even as we age, things just are different and things change and our mm -hmm. life circumstances change. When those things happen and you are hyper aroused, yeah, you're, yeah. you're overstimulated, you're agitated, you cannot come down to a place of calm, you know, you, you know, that you are not relying fully on God the way you should yeah. because you're having physiological reactions yes. to fears and stresses that are going on with you. Some tools, right? When we talk about casting down yes. every imagination, right. how do you do that? How do you do that when you have events that happen in your past that yeah. physiologically cause you to react in ways you're not sleeping anymore, you're yeah, worried, you're right. panicked. Your, your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And in mental health, mindfulness is talked about a lot, right? And that's just being present. Mm -hmm. There's physiological tools that you can use yeah. to cause your own body to check in with the temple first yeah. and move yourself out of the way so that God can marinate yeah. over your wound. Yes. And the scripture is the medicine. Yeah. That is, that is the antibiotic. Yeah. Okay. So those things are really simple and then we'll go into a little bit deeper. Simple things like diaphragm breathing, okay. practicing when you're not hyper aroused, you're not agitated, you're not irritated. When you're at home, laying down on a flat surface, breathing in through your nose for four seconds, watching your stomach go up, your chest at a rest, just like an opera singer, yeah. trumpet player, those people, and watching your stomach go up, hold for two seconds and breathe out slowly so that your blood can absorb the oxygen. Yeah. So you physiologically, when your blood gets oxygenated, you cannot stay at a heightened level of anxiety. You can't. Yeah. So when people say deep breathing doesn't work, they're not doing it right. Yeah. It, you're human. It has to work. Yeah. So practicing that. So when I feel those types of things where I feel I'm, I'm feeling unsteady, yeah. I'm feeling unhinged a little bit. What's happening is I, my faith isn't in my fortress, mm -hmm. which is God yeah. being my safe place, doing deep breathing and then going down in my temple and just focusing on each area and relaxing it. Mm -hmm. Focus on this area and relaxing it. Yeah. Focus on this air, relaxing it. Hopefully we're in our word on a semi-continual basis. Yeah. 
and we have a, a scripture or a line of a scripture that really ministers to, to that yeah. ache of like right. not having a parent or yeah. being abandoned or feeling ugly yeah. or feeling not wanted anymore yeah. or all the things that we can go through. And as then I do the deep breathing again and on my out breath, I'm quoting the scripture over me. It takes Danielle out of the way. Yeah. I don't want Danielle and Danielle's past and the way I think right. and how I've, uh, I'm a reason and logic it out. I don't want that. That doesn't work sometimes. Yeah. It doesn't work in the end ever, really. Only God's word is really the sure thing. But I cannot tell you how much that rewires your brain yeah. by itself. I've yeah. had a lot of people I've met with as a minister's wife, not meeting with them as yeah. a therapist. Yeah. And I have, I asked them to search out what I say, before we meet, I want you to bring a couple scriptures that you feel are ministering to this problem so you shared good. with That's me. That's really good. And yeah. when you read those, you get some sense, even mm -hmm. if it's 2%, yeah. you get some sense of relief. Something inside of you says, this has to do with this thing yes. inside of me. Yeah. And I have them start practicing it. It is life changing for yes. people. It yes. really, really is. Yes. So that there's ways to get yourself back into relationship with the fortress or that Jesus being your Prince of Peace. Yes. Wow. So, yeah, you know, it's almost it's almost like the opposite of what I think is called ru rumination mm -hmm. to ruminate mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. past experiences. Uh, and uh, uh, rumination is almost like this. Uh, you keep chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing and just thinking about the scenario over and over and over. Um, I remember uh, going through a season of high anxiety myself, and it was a particular season of anxiety that uh, was caused by the realization, first of all, I was single and lonely, right? I deeply wanted to be in a romantic relationship. I deeply wanted to find a wife, and thank God I found one. And, and a good one. Yes, a good one. It's, it's been an amazing time. But that time period was just immensely stressful because I, I would ruminate on my past, you know? I... You know, and uh, and I have a, a good relationship with my mother, but for the majority of my life, from 12 years old even to now, she was not part of my life in a significant way, the way that you would expect a mother to be. And and it, affection that I deeply longed for uh, in my body, because I was a very affectionate kid when I was a child. Uh, uh, I was very affectionate. The touch that I needed in my body that represented a deeper meaning of the soul, right, um, was not there. And so by the time I got to 26, 27, I deeply needed that. And I was working a job where I, I was blessed to work that job. I was a high school teacher, and I was blessed to be, be contributing to people's lives uh, daily, but there's something unique about being a high school teacher that drives you as close to insanity as possible <laughs> because teenagers are just in a time period where they don't listen mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it takes a lot of patience, mm -hmm. you know? And imagine a, a school of uh, uh, a classroom of 15, 20 that you have to deal with on a daily basis. The thought of having to do that again tomorrow and then do it again next week. And you know what? Next month, it's not going to change. I'm going to be here next month. And you start feeling when you start projecting towards the future. You start feeling next semester, it's going to be the same. Next year, oh, Lord, it's going to be the same. You're ministering and right now to teachers. Building and building <laughs> yes. and building. And it's like an endless, hopeless thing. Mm. And then you take your past and say, I've been lonely for so long and I'm still lonely now, and I'm caught in a cycle of stress. I'm caught in a cycle, a vortex of, 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 of anxiety. And that's what builds anxiety because you are imagining a future that only includes pain. It only includes, and both are not real, right? Both the past and the future are not real. Only the present is real. Mm -hmm. Only what is happening now. And I remember in my mind, I remember it in my mind, I have written, I wrote resignation letters when I was in that time period of my life to my pastor uh, and to Pastor Lopez, writing resignation letters saying, I can't take this. Like, I, I am not built for it. I don't have the mental capacity. I don't have the strength with willpower it's the resources aren't in within me for me to last and survive here. And the Lord would stop me 
And he would ask me, okay, you don't have to make it another week, but can you make it one more day? Mm. Can you trust in me to strengthen you one more day? Mm -hmm. You don't have to make it to next month. Can you make it through today? And I felt in me and said, God, I trust you for one more day. That happened on three occasions. And that day led to a next day, to a next day, until I made it through that season because God taught me how to live now. Right. In the present, yes. God can be your help. Don't worry about tomorrow. And yes. even tells his disciples that. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're mm -hmm. going to wear. Don't worry. about It has its own, uh, its own burden. Trust in the kingdom of God today. Trust in God today and he will take you where you need to go. Yes, and that is the key to panic attacks. A lot of things you talked about brought okay. up. Yeah. A lot of people get suicidal in that point. That's a yeah. way to fight, to say, I, when I look at my past, it's yeah. so humiliating Yeah, because of what happened, shame or whatever. I look at my future and I'm trapped. Mm. So I'm just going to take control of this situation mm -hmm. and I'm going to okay. squeeze myself out of this moment oh, yeah. and I'm going to get out of here. Yeah. There's that. And then it also reminded me of when I have clients that have really hard situations like that, or they have a child who has a seizure disorder. I mean, something that's going mm -hmm. on, they can't write a resignation. <laughs> I mean, there's literally yeah, no right. option. Yeah. You're there. Staying mindful. And you said one more day. I tell people in certain circumstances, you need to say, I'm okay right now. I'm safe right now. Yeah. It's 3, 23 in the afternoon. Yes, right. On October yeah. 4th. I'm uh, <laughs> yeah. On October 4th, I'm at on West Lane. And I'm safe. Yes. And yeah. then it's 324 in the afternoon. Right. You know, I'm at this address. It's this date and I'm safe. Yeah, I'm okay now. I have to stay right here. Now. No, I can't stay in three seconds from now. I can't right. live in three seconds from now. I have to live right now. And that's fine. You know, I, I, I experienced even that. I'm, I, I have this distinct memory in my mind of doing an algebraic problem for my high school students and teaching them how to do the algebra problem. It is so clear in my mind and it stands as one of the greatest testimonies that I have. And I'm writing this, and I start feeling these feelings of loneliness. I'm mm -hmm. alone. I have to do this again. And under my breath, as I'm writing the formula and saying, okay, so you minus this and you subtract that, and I'm trying to keep my composure in my mind as a storm. Mm -hmm. is this, and, and I say, dear God, help me get to, dear God, help me get to the break time. Because I knew at lunch, because I worked on this campus, I could run to the sanctuary and fall on my face before God and say, help me, God, for one more hour. Help me, God. And I was writing, and literally I was praying under my breath, God, help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me, dear Lord, God, help me. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know. And I did it. I taught them. Hey, kids, you're dismissed. Lunchtime. You will be back here at 1235. I'm walking to the sanctuary yeah. and I fall on my yeah. face and I say, Lord, I need you as my help. And his spirit came and it washed yeah. over me. And I wish I could say I was good for the next day. But no, I needed him for the next hour right. and for the next two hours. Right. And there are so many times that we have to run to God. But I thank God that he doesn't get tired of us running to him. That's right. You know, for every yes, minute and for right. every hour. Because every time you did that, you were growing that thread of safety. Right. And that's really my message to people that yeah. this is what I find most often is a lot of times there's, you know, things taught that are about how people have overcome things. And of course, that's your testimony. And that's great. And I don't put that down at all. Yeah. I don't negate the testimony because we all have to. And you just gave one. Yeah. So praise God for yeah. the testimony. But for people that are they go to the front and they get prayed for and they still feel bad. Yeah, right. They're fasting. They're praying. They're submitted to what God has in their life. They're humbling themselves. They're asking God why. I had someone tell me the other day, sometimes when a, a message is preached about something about mental health and I say, okay, I'm going to go to the front and then I, I don't feel better. I feel better in the moment and mm -hmm. then I don't feel better later that night. I think, was it wrong for me to go to the front? Should mm -hmm. I not have prayed? Okay. No, stay with stay it. With Just it, like if right. you had a traumatic event that right. happened over and over and over and over, it would right. strengthen your reaction. It, conditioned, it, it will condition you. Yeah. Having those moments, even if you have, you get a sweet presence of God for that's one it. second. That's yes. another drop hold in your. Hold on to it. Hold on to it. Yes. That's right, because over time, if yeah. you don't give up, 
you don't give up. You're guaranteed to overcome this at yeah. some point. Yeah. That's a given. Yeah. And, and, and I would say this, that, uh, the, that which conditioned you to be in that state of anxiety and depression and hopelessness, if you give the word of God and the spirit of God a, a chance, it will condition new modes of yes. thinking. It will condition new pathways. We call them pathways, right? And in, in psychology, they'll call them neural pathways. Mm -hmm. But just imagine a neural pathway also being nourished by the Spirit of God. Well, it's really an automatic response. Yeah. Nobody wants to have to struggle to feel victorious. They want to just feel victorious. Feel it. It's done. <laughs> yes. I got it. Yep. For now and on, yeah. I'm victorious. Yes, yeah. it didn't even get right. to me because I uh -huh. automatically knew God was yeah. going to take care of it. Wow. Over yeah. time. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's scriptural, right? That's scriptural is, uh, you know, many times we have an over idealized view of deliverance that it happens once and one and for all, mm -hmm. you know, many times in Pentecost, we have that over idealized view, but even the apostle Paul himself assumes process and assumes, uh, having to intentionally give yourself over to a new mind because he says in Ephesians, renew the spirit of your mind taking off the old man and putting on the new, mm -hmm. you know? If the Apostle Paul is talking to Christians and he says, take off the old man, that assumes that the old man can jump on you. Yes. And it does come mm -hmm. back on you. That's right. But you can intentionally, you don't have to say, well, here it is again. I'm struggling with this again. And identify and say, this will be my future forever. The Apostle Paul assumes that there's going to be the struggle, and you can then say, I am choosing to take this off me again, and I'm renewing the spirit of my mind, what is I'm allowing to influence my mental patterns, what I'm allowing to influence my imagination and my fantasy. I'm intentionally holding on to the Word of God, to those spiritual moments that were important in my life, those moments that I did go to the altar, and if any, if, if it even was for a second, like you were saying, I am choosing to identify that with that and pursue that, uh, because some people are more deeply bound by these past experiences than others, and it might take a longer period of time. Yeah, especially at the earlier that you were bound or right. you okay. were things were done to or you are upon you or around yeah. you while well. your brain was like play-doh mm. and it was being molded the yeah. softer your brain was yeah. right the more impact that it makes yeah and so one of the things that i think is important to bring up too and i felt like you're kind of alluding to a, a little bit without saying it is the shame factor mm. okay having yeah. the expectation that the old man is going to come Right. On you, right? That's right. And that is something that when I have apostolic clients, I deal with most primarily is the shame factor. Yeah, okay. For people in the world, they accept, they're okay with not doing okay. I mean, they're not totally okay with it because they're there. They want to change. Yeah. But they don't take it personal that they're still struggling, most of them, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Right. A lot of apostolic and Christian people, they feel ashamed for feeling anything negative at all. Yeah, That right. is the bad act. Yeah, you did something bad because you feel bad. Because it somehow invalidates the power of Christ. Yes, and they're not yeah. having faith in God. Wow. And that's how they take it, which compounds the issue, and mm. it keeps them stuck longer. It's wow. actually it's actually the— And even uh, denying, in denial. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, right. So yeah. I think that looking at sometimes your own childhood and understanding is, you know, as good as your caregivers did their best, and we all do our best as parents— it's not to completely blame or shame them. However, knowing and understanding that the younger you were, where you were blamed mm. for things when they primarily were not your fault, when you were made to feel responsible for other people and maybe failed mm -hmm. or you, you felt failed. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when we do trauma work. I have quite a few older siblings that were babysitting younger siblings at ages seven and eight and a younger sibling might have died by drowning or almost die yeah and they feel their whole rest of their life it happens a lot with older siblings it sounds seems like but mm -hmm. you know and we everybody your first child is your guinea pig right you kind of you do things that you go oh yeah Ugh. you know so what i'm trying to say though is having that thread built of it's my fault i should have done something it's yeah. my fault i should have done something i'm it's my fault having expectations expectations 
builds that thread and it eventually affects your walk with God. Yeah. So you don't look at verses like that automatically and understand that you should expect that you're going to struggle sometimes and that's okay. You've never, your whole life, you're 47 or something and you've never been okay with not being okay. And some therapist or some person is saying, it's okay that you're not okay. It's not easy just to yeah. all Rewire. of a sudden believe that. Yeah. yeah, that's very that's been wired in there for yeah. so many years. And that shame factor is a huge hindrance and it's really demonic. Yeah. It's it's really oppression that ends up oppression. Oh absolutely. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, so let's uh, that shame factor, right? That shame factor. What is it about shame that that in essence, the same way that faith and hope shields your pa- positive uh, outlook, your identification with what you can be and Christ's formation in you, it seems like shame is also this defense or this, uh, this barrier between uh, you and overcoming, you know. Uh, what is it about shame that's so potent? That's so potent. In my opinion... Fear is in the core is the core of shame. Okay. And fear is so demonic. Yeah. And usually, again, I always say this with trepidation because we're talking to a broad audience and yeah, a lot of people right. have a lot of different situations. I'm yeah. talking in generalities right now. Yeah. But in general, when a parent is shaming a child, in general, there's, in my opinion, a spirit of fear mm-hmm. that's being released. Mm, okay. Okay. Right? So yeah. I'm afraid that you are going to not be able to make it in the world. So I'm going to say, stop talking like that. Right. Stop doing that. Right. So there's fear involved. You're releasing a spirit of fear when you overstep your boundaries as a human and tell people how to feel. Yeah. God has given autonomy to each of us to feel Mary and Martha, right? Lord, Lord, why is my sister not helping me? Mm -hmm. Says, you know, Martha, Martha, you're worried about many things. He reflects back how she feels. He doesn't say, you know, come on, seriously, God in flesh and you're going to complain. You know, he doesn't start shaming her. He's yeah. he gets humans. He made them. He understands yeah. that she's upset right now. Right. He knows girls. He gets it. You know, he's not he's accepting of her yeah. feelings. Yeah. He's pointing out a different perspective. Right. But he he's accepting of her feelings. Yeah. So what I, the that fear gets I believe spiritually transmitted. I will have families come to me mm. where kids are having nightmares. Mhm. My daughter had a nightmare the other night. I'm not trying to say every time right. it has a nightmare, there's a spirit of fear spirit possessing your Spirit of fear and house. trauma and yeah. Yeah, no, but I'm saying in general, I'm talking pervasive, chronic, yes, over and over, right. can't get rid of it. It's, it's, a, it's basically, it overtakes. Yeah. Usually there's somebody that's an authority in the home mm-hmm. that God's given them authority who is releasing fear yeah. in their own life. Yeah, wow. I know that sounds kind of like reading into things, but these are patterns that I have anecdotally seen yeah. over and over yeah. and over and over and over. What we do, even if our kids don't know it, yeah. it does, people will say, well, I don't tell my kid that. They know in a that you're releasing spirits in your home when you yeah. entertain things. You yeah. say things to your spouse yeah. in private when your child's not around. You do things on your phone that your spouse doesn't even know about. Yeah. You're releasing things in your home. Wow. And then you see it trickle down. Yeah the line yeah so shame usually in any context where a child has been shamed there's a fear response Mm -hmm. by a parent somebody's fearing yeah and so that fear it bleeds out into everything when you're older right i'm struggling when there's shame under struggle right like why am i still feeling anxious why is this still bothering me whatever whatever you're afraid what something's wrong with you (laughs) right you're afraid that it's not going to, you know, this may work for all these people, but it won't work for me because I'm inherently broken. I'm inherently, right? Yeah. You speak in those ways many times that you release spirits into the home. Uh, there is, uh, you know, th- that reinforces a lot of um, my understanding of this scripture in Second Corinthians. I think it's Second Corinthians 10, 5 and 6. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but powerful through God to the pulling down of strongholds, mm-hmm. casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If, and, and this is the, the, the shortened version of that scripture, uh, the word of God is talking about spiritual strongholds. And it says that it casts down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. 
subjecting every thought to Christ. Okay, right. that means that the strongholds that the enemy uses are directly correlated to imagination, to mindsets. Imagination there is had doesn't just have to do with the things that you picture in your mind. The imagination there has to do with everything that is related to thinking and the mind. And so if it casts down imaginations and it casts down those mental strongholds, those mental and strongholds means something that is uh, has a foundation. It is has a has a a, has a root, kind has of permanence. Root. Yes, has taken root, has a lasting permanence. Let's call them patterns of thinking. OK, we can easily just call them patterns of thinking. Your common way of thinking time after time after time. The, the, uh, the, those are the strongholds that God wants to take down by his power. And if the enemy and if satanic uh, um, powers follow mindsets, mindsets and patterns of thinking, then it directly supports exactly what you're saying. When, you, when one is cultivating a mindset that is around shame, the enemy takes advantage of that and spirits are released then to take advantage of mm -hmm. that situation and reinforce those mindsets that will carry that child or it doesn't even have to be a child that your spouse, mm -hmm. whether it's a husband to a wife or even a wife to a husband, mm -hmm. it will reinforce those pathways, those mindsets of yeah. fear based life. Yes. That's and right. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind yes that's right, right you know Absolutely. and so uh it directly correlates with that there would be spirits that are trying to take advantage of those p uh, patterned ways of thinking that will keep you bound to a fear-based living yes yeah. and that's why i think it is so important to quote scripture over your mind that yeah. directly targets your fear yeah and ministers to that wound. God yeah. has, there's a scripture in here that directly targets that root fear yeah. of whatever that situation is, yeah. always. Wow. But if you don't address your humanness, yeah. it's okay to be human. Right. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. It's okay to have to take a break yeah. and have to address your own body yeah. and center yourself and readjust to go into a situation. Yeah. My biggest fear my biggest concern or biggest thing that I watch out for for myself personally mm -hmm. is that is fear. Yeah. Because on top of fear is yeah. shame. Yeah. And on top of shame is pride. Yeah. And to me, what I have seen and experienced is pride is the cancer of the Christian walk. Mm. It is a thing that can go undetected yeah. and all of a sudden someone right. drops. Wow. Yeah. It's also the thing you can't usually self diagnose. Mm -hmm. So if you had, think you might have cancer, you go to the mm -hmm. doctor, yeah. right? You can't, you don't know if you do or not, yeah. right? So you need somebody else to help you with that. Yeah. You can't do cancer on wow. your own. Yeah. You can't do pride on your own. Yeah. You're too close to it. Usually because yeah. it's rooted in those things as well. Well, the Bible describes not being prideful as being sober-minded, which actually helps us understand that the biblical perspective, perspective of pride is that what alcohol does to the mind physiologically pride does to the soul it, what happens when you get drunk right you become less sensitive to the world you uh think in uh in unclear ways uh and in sometimes so much everyone sense. knows that you're drunk except you you that's don't right. think you're drunk that's right. i can drive the car yeah. oh no no problem no no yeah. i'm not drunk at all yeah. and everybody knows that you are mm -hmm. except for you pride does not allow you to appropriately introspect that's right and look into yourself because it's scary because you're afraid ah right it's pride is right. self uh, yeah. preservation yeah that's all that it is yeah. and so now i would you know just just to get into some recommendations here um, my experience is the best way to address pride is not even to ask god to take pride away mm. but to practice humility Right. It, it, I, I, that the antidote is not God take away my pride. The antidote is help me to practice humility, and in practicing humility and saying God, I submit myself to you. I let you take control over my life. I'm casting my cares upon you. 
because I, I believe you care for me, then pride is neutralized because pride and humility cannot walk together. That's right. They cannot per, uh, persist together. One thing I thought about when you're saying that, that I've recommended to people and I've done myself is I know where I keep shame in my body. Mm -hmm. I know okay. when I, my shame is triggered, I know exactly where it is. For what me. do you mean? Describe that a little bit more. When I've been shamed in the past or I feel embarrassed or I feel, oh, I just, I feel abandoned. I'm very yeah. aware yeah. when that happens. So I know in my body before I know what's happening. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So for me, when I feel a sense of shame, I feel it right in the middle of my chest. Okay. So that can start happening and I'm like, okay, what just happened? Yeah, right. Wow. For me, because I know shame has to do with pride, I know pride is coming. Yeah, wow. <laughs> when that happens, yeah, I better deal. There's with a it. risk of mm -hmm. putting yeah. up the walls and uh -huh. defend. Wow. So, mm. so when that happens, I have to deal with it. Mm. I want to deal with it, mm -hmm. and that goes with humbling myself. Yes. Okay. So for me, that means I have a safe person yeah. who's a sounding board in my life. Yeah. He's not a peer. There's someone that. I can, I holds me accountable Yeah, that I can talk to about it Yeah, wow. because I don't want it to take root because what happens when it takes root, my instinctive defenses will start coming up mm, okay. and I will start acting, uh, have a habituated response or a habit yeah. response Yeah, and things will start going on that I'm not even aware of. Wow. And I know all this because I almost spiritually died by that at wow. one point in my wow. life. So now I'm very aware, yeah. Yeah. just like someone who had cancer maybe and went yeah. to the brink, right? Yeah. And so wow. now they say, okay, the doctor says if this and this and this happens, you need to come in for a checkup. Right. Because for you, for someone that else, that might mean this, but for you. Yes. Wow. And so I have seen often, and I feel like I did this as well at one point, pride can be, look like humility, right? Mm -hmm. So covering, I call sometimes when, I, I again, I only know this from personal experience, so I'm not trying to just right, right, right. people, so but- is, yeah. You know, low self-esteem clothed in humility, right? Okay, yeah. So one thing my pastor, he talked about a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, wow, I wish I would have heard that when I was me, because I remember this. Yeah. He was talking about when I went through, for me, this was my testimony, I went through infertility for years. I could not have a baby. You could not, medically, doctors said, no, this isn't going to happen for you. I would say things like, well, if there's, you know, kids with cancer, why would God do that for me? Yeah. I can live without a baby. I don't mm -hmm. have to have one. I want mm -hmm. one. Who am oh, okay. I? Yeah. Wow. Who am I that God would give yeah. me something I want when people need things? Wow. That's self-preservation. Yes. I don't want to yes. get hurt. You were afraid to believe yes. that he would. That wow. it would happen for Danielle. Wow. And I would think maybe it's going to be a medical miracle that's documented. And I would go, why would I think that? See, I'm just trying to make right. myself feel. That's exactly wow. what happened. Yeah. That was now I've learned and I grew through that, that God was talking to me. So now when yes. other things come up. Because that's not the last battle or hill I've had to climb. Yeah. When other things come up, I go, okay, my response is going to be different this time. Yeah. When the Spirit's speaking to me, I'm going to take it. Yeah. I'm going to capture it. And I'm going to praise God for yeah. it. And I'm going to thank God for it. Right. So anyways, it's very interesting. But all of that's rooted in shame. Mm -hmm. Deep roots of shame. Wow. Wow. You know, in, in, in many ways, we have to be allied to the Spirit in, in this way in saying that everything that I feel in the spirit is what's real and everything that I that is outside of that, that wants to challenge that which the Holy Ghost has told me, has assured me of, is the fantasy. That's right. right? Because many times individuals hide pessimistic thought by labeling it uh, just i i'm i'm just a real thinker i just think in reality i'm a realist, I'm a realist right mm -hmm. that's what they say but in reality they're not a realist mm -hmm. they're captive by fear mm -hmm. and fear hides itself as realism mm -hmm. uh you know i'm just real i just i just you know and i and i and um you know i'm i'm connected i'm down to earth and i and i just know i just uh, am a realist but it's not realism it's just as much fantasy as anything else to imagine the negative outcomes and then right. assume that that's exactly what's going to happen or that's most likely what's going to happen rather than assuming that which the spirit tells you right he makes a way when there is no way that's right how Amen. real is that that's to right. you right and you need to feed 
that word of God. Yes. Feed the word of God in your heart. I appreciate my husband being a spiritual leader because I had many years where I said I would cry and he'd say, mm -hmm. you know, when we have a baby and I'd say, if. Yeah. I would. It's wow. embarrassing. It's yeah. true. Yeah. He'd say, no, when. Yeah. He didn't want me talking like that. I yeah. try, and I feel like we're never, uh, Yeah. we don't talk like that. Yeah. Not here. Right. I wow. could cry in his arms. Yeah. I could say, I'm having a bad day, honey. And yeah. I had these thoughts. And in an authentic way, I would, could tell him, I, today I had the thought that, what if we never have a baby? And he yeah. was very, very patient with that. Yeah. But when I'm speaking as if it's reality. Yes. yes. That's yeah. not where you cross the line yeah. in this house, right? Because right. we're not going to do that here. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I, I appreciated that because mm. when you have someone in your life that you know you're safe with, you can be vulnerable with, a true healthy relationship is someone that says, I don't receive that. Mm. Wow. That's, oh. that's incredible. You know, it, it takes so much courage to believe, though, right? Yeah, it it's, does. It takes so much courage. And even with God, it's, it's multiplied so because God is a God of the miraculous. He, he doesn't even invite us to normal life. He says, the just shall live by faith. That's right. Right? And we live by faith and not by sight. That's right. So, you know, and, 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 and you see, that's, that's the, I think that's the amazing thing about being apostolic is that we're not just believing that we could be normal. Right. That we can live a normal life. Right. We are actually by the help. And this is why the Holy Ghost is so important in our development. We talk yes. about PTSD. We talk about trauma. Right. We talk about healing on a human level. But this is where apostolics are destined to go. Yes. Achieve the normal and then proceed past. That's right. And say, I even believe God for the impossible right, now. Amen. Not only do I believe that he can heal my heart because yes. of past, but I also believe he can provide for a new building for the sanctuary. Yes, I also right. believe that he can bring my child back yes. and my backslidden child back. I also believe that he can heal the sick. You know, yes. I also, and it takes us beyond the human level mm -hmm. of just hoping positive things right, into wish. believing faith, which yes. is the uh, substance of things hoped yes. for. And, and the then you act on things. that, exactly. right? Because it's substance. It's not a wish. Right. Then you act on that and yeah. you show your faith by your works. Yes. Wow. That's powerful. You know, and the Bible describes uh, Abraham in that same, you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things seen. It says he sojourned. He, he wandered in a land as a foreigner looking for the city whose builder is the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he wandered the land that he knew what is, was his, his her inheritance faith, mm -hmm. uh, but knowing that he is not there, right? right? So, and that's the interesting thing about God and about our mindsets. A lot of people who are atheists and don't understand the biblical mindset will say, you guys are all just delusional. Right. right. Uh, you're just making up things. It's just another way of coping and mm -hmm. trying to make so up things in your mind. Bad. So you don't have to feel We're dissociating. bad. <laughs> right. We're dissociating. Mm -hmm. But the Bible actually assumes both and. Mm -hmm. And it says Abraham recognized he was in a foreign place. He understands I am in a foreign place, but also working in his spirit is the inheritance that God said that he would achieve. And mm -hmm. he was looking with faith for the city whose builder is the Lord. Right. And that is the pathway of an apostolic who says, look, I know we don't have the funds. I'm not right. trying to deny that. Right. I know that it seems impossible. That's not something we're hiding from. That's right. Amen. But we also believe that God, it, he intervenes right. in human affairs. He's greater than the reality. And he's greater than the reality. Right. And that's the dynamic. And probably... The, one of the, you know, at least from a practical speaking way, the reason why there isn't high volumes of mental illness in the apostolic church, uh, you know, I, I would assume like if I put myself in the shoes of an atheist mm -hmm. uh, psychologist who sees the kind of language that happens in a church uh, of fantastical speaking, right? you know, uh, stories that are fan, mm -hmm. God is going to make a way. And they can say, and I would imagine if I, and I, I don't know, because I'm not an atheist, right? Imagine them saying, how are there not more mental ill people here? Mm -hmm. Because they're just always speaking about things that aren't real. And yet you see us with joy. Mm -hmm. You see us with, with a smile on mm -hmm. our mouths. You see mm -hmm. us with genuine joy in our mm -hmm. spirits. 
as a result of praying, praying mm -hmm. in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, believing the mm -hmm. Word of God. And, uh, and, and it's because uh, children of God are never not grounded in reality. Right. It's just that we believe in a God that yes. sees reality and then yes. rises above it. That's right. right? Amen. Yeah. That's the, those are the, and I'm just like spitting things out, of course, you know, because when I get going, <laughs> exciting. yeah, it is very exciting. Yeah. You know, it is very exciting. Um, so, um, let me, let me, uh, I like proposing some practical tips here. Okay. Um, not every apostolic is going to be seeking counseling, has the time, has the, has the resources. Um, if there is someone out there who at this moment in time is struggling with trauma, they're struggling with their patterns of thought. Mm-hmm experiencing flashbacks or recurring ruminating thoughts of failure um, or shame. What are things that they can do today to begin this process of putting on the new man, renewing your mind? Mm -hmm. What are things that practical things that they can do today to help them, especially in those extreme moments when it seems those negative thoughts are overwhelming yes. and taking over their lives? Safe relationships are so important. You okay. can't overemphasize that. And having somebody or knowing somebody that you can at least talk about it with, that you feel safe with, would, is ask God to bring that person to you. He will. Mm -hmm. Also, what I talked about earlier is getting in touch with your body, your temple. God made our body to wire itself around protecting us. Yeah. So it's okay to address it. Yeah. Just like if your body was having another uh, adverse reaction like you had digestive issues mm -hmm. or other things you'd address your body you'd up your mm -hmm. hydration you'd stay away from certain foods yeah adjust to focus on your own body exercise yeah. is really really good for people that are experiencing things like that it yeah. helps bring certain ador endorphins and releases good chemicals in them and all that also having some time every day to address your physiological responses in your body or the tension and the stress that is happening mm -hmm. in your body i talked about earlier practicing the deep diaphragm breathing I talked about. Yeah. Laying down on a flat surface. I'm just say it again. Laying down on a flat surface. Mm -hmm. Put a stuffed animal or a small object on your stomach and breathe in four seconds like you're you're smelling a, a cookie. Mm -hmm. Hold for two seconds and blow out slowly. Mm -hmm. You're gonna people say doing that on a regular basis changes everything for mm -hmm. them. And then after you do, you do one breath in and one breath out, one breath in, one breath out before you go to bed. It doesn't have to be this big old thing. It could yeah. just be a few minutes that you spend to start. You're starting to build neural pathways that it's safe to be in my body. I'm in touch with my body. Mm -hmm. After that, if you feel comfortable with that, add the body scanning I talked about where you're picturing every section of your body and you're releasing. Picture the next section and release it. Mm -hmm. Picture the next... When you're outside of that room and you start to feel triggered, you're going to feel it way before it gets to the heightened level. You're going to feel right away, my shoulders are tense. Take a deep breath. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Release my shoulders. Yeah. Sometimes before, if I'm nervous about something, I'll sit there. Nobody knows what's going on. Yeah. They think I'm praying. Right. I take a deep breath that nobody knows my stomach's expanding, not my yeah. chest. I, I breathe out and I do a scan. And usually I'm tense here and I'll release it. Say, God, please wash over me right now, God. In Jesus' name, give yeah. me grace. And that's all I need. Mm -hmm. But yeah. these things start by practicing them when they're not happening, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. Journal about things that have happened to you if you need to get them out. Write them down if yeah. that's the best that you can do right now. Yeah. Like I said, pray for God to send a safe person in your life. I'm sure they're there somewhere in the church. You just haven't met them yet. Yeah, That you can share some things with that can handle that and yeah. can listen to you or yeah. relate to you possibly. Yeah. And what you've right. been through. Yeah, that's great. You know, and I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm reminded of this, a psalm, uh, which there are many psalms that are called the lament psalms mm -hmm. that go through recognizing states of being that are attached to anxiety. They're attached to fear. Um, and one of them goes like this. It says, why are you disquieted in my soul? Why are you disquieted in your soul? Believe in the Lord your God, you know, and, and in essence, you're recognizing then your state of being and saying, I am in a state of worry. Yes, uh, you're yes. asking yourself that same question. Yes. And, uh, and, and it's physiological mm -hmm. as well. You feel, okay, I feel it. 
Why am I disquieted? Believe in the Lord your God. Release it to God. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, in essence, it seems like what you're suggesting is this a combination between practical and spiritual right. coming together. Yes. Um, and integrating that within that moment of time. Yes, that's right. It, and and is it, you know, and I could imagine it's important to practice it in that exact moment. Yes. When so, it comes, it has to. So that's game time. Okay. You know, you don't practice on game day. That's right. not when you decide to. Well, what is okay football? Well, what yeah. is that again? You know, no. You practice all these at times right. before, and then when game time comes, guess what? It's easy. Yeah, that's awesome. You have it like that. Love it. I love those suggestions, and I think a lot of people are going to be blessed by it.